What's up guys, welcome back to Newswave. So yesterday, we had some pretty surprising game announcements happen, one of which really caught my eye, because we haven't seen a new game in this series for almost two decades now. We'll go over all of that here today. Also, we are going to be talking about gaming's biggest event, that being E3, making a return next year with some new details that has me very hopeful for the event. And we're also going to be talking about that all-digital future and uh, what happens if there are issues with rights around purchases that you've already made. Guys, if you enjoy these videos, make sure you hit that like button. Helps out a ton. And if you're new here to the Spawn Wave channel, make sure you subscribe down below. And we're going to start today with Xenoblade Chronicles 3. This game is coming out at the end of this month, July 29th. I'm very excited for it. I enjoyed Xenoblade Chronicles 1, especially Definitive Edition on the Switch, and Xenoblade Chronicles 2 that saw me spend like 130 or some odd hours in that game. But Xenoblade Chronicles 3 did have its final previews go up yesterday with many different outlets. A lot of videos were also published. And for the most part, they all spent about 20 or 30 hours in. They all said, yeah, we just scratched the surface of this game, which, yeah, sounds like a big monolith soft Xenoblade game as expected there. But a lot of them spent 80% of the time talking about the battle system, which probably comes down to them also working to avoid any major story spoilers, which they did. So if you're curious about the game, I would check these videos out because they really go in depth attempting to explain the battle system and how it seems more involved than any of the other Xenoblade games prior, which that might be kind of daunting for newcomers to the series because there is a lot going on with the battle system as is being described. And instead of the blade system, which I was very happy to hear this, we have the seventh uh, member in your party that will be taking part in battle and you'll get different abilities and skills for your jobs and subclasses from them. And you find them when quests and all this rather than have to do like a randomized spin of a wheel for Xenoblade Chronicles 2. But definitely check out these previews, especially if you have not played a Xenoblade game, you may want to hear some opinions around that battle system before you jump in. Also, we got to look at the next big collaboration between Lego and Nintendo. We can see it here. It's the Mighty Bowser. That's right. It's coming out October 1st, according to Lego's website at $270. I think that's the most expensive collaboration here so far with Nintendo and Lego. It is uh, 2,807 pieces. It's rated mature at 18 plus. It's actually just the difficulty for the age there. But they say uh, you can control Bowser's head and neck with a button under the shell. So you can open and close the mouth. You can pose the arms, hands, legs, tail. You even have a fireball launcher. That, that you can uh, control here. And the platform has a hidden POW block for enhanced play with starter courses and, and all this. And they've done a lot so far between LEGO and Nintendo. They have the Super Mario 64 question mark block, a bunch of other smaller sets, and that Nintendo Entertainment System that I, I think is really cool when they did those si the system like that. I would like to see a Super Nintendo and a Nintendo 64 at some point, but this is one to keep an eye on, obviously, if you're a big fan of LEGO or Nintendo, because when it does go up for pre-order and all this, it, it's going to sell out pretty quickly. So make sure you keep an eye on it. Oh, and I told you guys I would keep you up to date on Skull and Bones. We did get that release date yesterday during the live stream. It's coming out November 8th. During the live stream, they showed off a bunch of gameplay and they attempted to explain all the mechanics to it. And I got to say, I left the live stream just not very interested in this title at all. It really is, as, as we figured and as was kind of being described prior, a spin-off to specifically the naval combat for Assassin's Creed. I mean, like, really the, just the naval combat. There are points where you get off the ship mostly to walk around a settlement to do some crafting, which at least sounds like an interesting idea where you'll hunt wildlife and stuff like crocodiles and you'll then uh, bring parts back to build things for your ship, whether it's weapons or, I guess, defensive items. And they have different events that happen in the world. And, of course, all the multiplayer elements are there, as you expect, from a Ubisoft game, but I don't know. I, the naval combat itself didn't really interest me as its own game from Assassin's Creed, but if you're a big fan of specifically that in like Assassin's Creed Black Flag, make sure you keep this one on your radar that coming out November 8th. And guys, with some of the quick news out of the way, let's get into the bigger stuff. Let's start right away with a couple of surprising game announcements yesterday. This coming out of the NatCon Connect 2022. Sort of their own showcase, like a direct or a state of play, where they show off different games that they currently have in development, one of which seems like it's in very early development. But let's start with the really exciting game that I, I was, was very happy to see. It's a new RoboCop game. Take a look at this trailer here. This is for RoboCop Rogue City. 
It's coming out on all platforms, PC, PlayStation 5, Xbox Series, and Nintendo Switch next year, June 2023. So it sort of makes sense why they're just making the push for PS5 and Xbox Series, not for PS4 or Xbox One, because we're still like a calendar year out from it, right? Now, this had the big reveal at the end where they will have Peter Weller performing voiceover work for the game. So if you were like concerned, oh, this is a game they're going to kind of phone in, it'll be one of those one of those games from like a smaller developer that they push out there with just the, the title for the licensing and collect some quick money. Not necessarily because the gameplay they showed while it was brief, it looked, looked pretty interesting. I, I, I thought it looked good for what they're aiming for, which is an action first person shooter for RoboCop, which to me makes a lot of sense based on the IP. In fact, you figure the RoboCop franchise would be an easy one to make video games around. But we haven't had like a major console or, or game release from this series since 2003 on the original Xbox, PS2, and GameCube. Otherwise, it's been on phones. I think like 2004, they had a game in 2014 on like iOS, Android devices. So it was really cool to see this reveal. And I'm, I'm very interested to see more about this as we go through the rest of this year. I'm sure they'll be releasing different gameplay trailers and all this. It does kind of make me think about that double A segment in games where... We have games come out that are like 10 to 12 hours long, and I think it's a good spot for them to exist like a RoboCop game where they don't have to feel like they have to force out like this 40 or 50 hour game that it's very clear they have a lot of padding in there. I have no problem with games that are very snappy and, 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 and satisfying and quick going through with these action titles that have a, an obvious start and end point. And that's just sort of what I'm envisioning RoboCop to be. But the other game that was revealed is one that I'm kind of trying to wrap my head around. Take a look at this. This is the other trailer. This is for Untitled Terminator Survival Game. That's that's all they have so far. It's Untitled. They, this one is in pretty early development, I, I would assume, based on that. But they say it's based or it's set between the events of Judgment Day and the formation of John Connor's Resistance. It's an open world survival game. I mean, in the trailer, we see the T-800 kind of looking around for someone or something. So it makes me wonder if this is gonna be kind of like Alien Isolation, just on a, on a broader scale where you have the T-800 model chasing you around, maybe through a set of story events and eventually you're able to defeat it at the end or something there. Now, there was a game that I guess would fall into the double A category is Terminator Resistance. And I looked into it just really after I saw this. I was like, what, what's been, what's Terminator been up to here? And I saw that. People seem to really like it. So I might look into that one. They have an enhanced edition for the PlayStation 5 and it might be worth picking up. It's like 10 or 12 hours long. Hey, it seems like uh, right there for that double A segment. They could kind of play over the course of like a week or so when I, as I have time here and there. But an untitled Terminator game and a brand new RoboCop game to look forward to next year coming out of this NatCon event. That's pretty good. I really wasn't expecting a lot out of it. So to see these two titles get announced is pretty exciting. Also, let me know if you played this Terminator Resistance game. I just completely missed it when it dropped in 2019. So I'm excited to go back to it and see what it's all about. Next up, let's talk about E3 2023 as the event will be making its full return next year in June. And we have some new details around how it's going to be organized as the ESA is partnering with Read Pop, who's been able to organize other events like PAX or Star Wars Celebration. So they definitely know how to put together a show like that. And E3 has been kind of floundering over the past several years now. So if Read Pop can come in and maybe change some things up, streamline it a bit more and return it to its former glory that was, I mean, at this point, probably seven or eight years ago, I'm all for it, but we can actually see this posted up. This was over on Variety, going into a bit more detail here, where they say E3 2023 will welcome back publishers, developers, journalists, content creators, manufacturers, buyers, and licensors. In addition, the event will feature digital showcases and in-person consumer components. Now they go on further to say, we are thrilled to bring back E3 as an in-person event with Read Pop, a global leader in producing pop culture events. The past three years have confirmed that E3 convenes our industry like no other event. You know, I'm, I'm inclined to agree with them a bit here because we've had Summer Game Fest. And that still just didn't feel like E3. That week in June where you, you marked it on your calendar, you're like, all right, everything's going to happen right here. It's very, like, spread out, it's sporadic. It's all over the place without E3. So I would like to see E3 come back if they can do it 
correctly. And that's been the biggest question mark with the ESA is, can they actually figure it out now in modern times where yet yeah, things are going more and more to the digital side of things, especially in the past couple of years where they weren't able to hold in-person events. But that's kind of what E3 needs is that big in-person event. And the other part of this, I don't necessarily think E3 should be a show that they're selling tickets to and building up as this big entertainment spectacle because then people buy tickets, they go there, and they just wait in line for 10 to 12 hours at a time to play a game for 15 minutes. Which seems like a waste of time, obviously. I know people get the experience of E3 week and all this, but they may be better suited that being the ESA and Reed Pop to kind of separate things out, have an event that is properly set up and prepared for a large number of gamers and consumers to come in and check things out. And another side to just be all about media and, uh, and big publishers and developers and everyone getting together to discuss games and get interviews and, and all of this. So if Reed Pop can pull this off, I'd be really happy to see that. So here's hoping that E3 can make its big return next year, June 2023. And wouldn't you know it, Jeff Keighley, Summer Game Fest, had to make sure they made their own announcement right next to it that, yeah, it will be returning as well, 2023. Do we really need two big events like this right next to each other, though? Because we already kind of spread thin this year with announcements. Will the gaming industry be back to full strength next year with game announcements all over the place that they can divide up between the two shows. Hard to say, but I guess we'll see next year. It's at least good to hear that E3 is going to at least attempt to make another run at it, and they're bringing in some people who know what they're doing. Next up, let's talk about the all-digital future, which is something that's basically inevitable at this point with the way game sales are trending. I mean, we're getting to the point where some of these big publishers are reporting 70 or 80% digital to physical sales. So yeah, it's uh, we're, we're getting there more and more every year at this point. But there are some pretty big concerns and drawbacks to a future where everything's in the hands of, uh, say, the digital storefront and even companies that you're buying from. For example, we see this posted up. This is over on PlayStation.com. It's a legal notice. I want to also point out this specifically is affecting uh, Germany and Austria, to my understanding. But it says, Studio Canal affected titles as of August 31st, 2022. Due to our evolving licensing agreements with content providers, you will no longer be able to view your previously purchased Studio Canal content and it will be removed from your video library. Now, it's not all bad news. I saw on the list of movies and, and shows that they released, Daredevil 2003 is on there with Ben Affleck. So they're kind of doing you a favor removing that from your video library. But obviously, the issue is they're just taking stuff back from you that you did purchase. I assume no refunds are issued. They just... Yeah, we're just taking it. That That's kind of it. And these are just movies in specific regions now. I understand that. But this is just kind of showcasing a drawback and concern that people have right now with a future where it is indeed in the hands of the rights holders if you actually own that thing or have access to that thing. Could we get to a point where it is 100% across the board and maybe one day we have right disputes or licensing issues around some large, like several titles from one company with... Xbox or PlayStation or Nintendo, and they have to start pulling them out of your library despite you spending 60 or even $70 on them. Just something to keep an eye on here. I know there is a lot of convenience around just digital purchases and all that, but I still push the physical sale mentality because it's at least better to have that copy of Daredevil 2003 on your shelf because you assume Studio Canal is going to kick in your door and try to take it off the shelf. You your Daredevil 2003 will be safe if you had it on Blu-ray or DVD. And in our last bit of news, let's talk about GameStop. And it's been an interesting ride for this company over the last several years with most of it having nothing to do with video games, the whole meme stock thing that turned Wall Street on its side. And it's, it's been all over the place. But it has certainly been a market that's not very kind to GameStop now, specifically on the video game side of things where we just talked about the split between digital and physical becoming much more in favor of digital, which means GameStop not selling as many copies and not getting as many trade-ins on their most profitable side of the business, that being used games. Well, we can see this tweet from Steven Totillo who says, breaking GameStop CFO out, which that CFO to my understanding was there for 
less than a year, I think, layoffs across company, including at GameStop proper and Game Informer. Unclear how hard people have been hit, but doesn't sound small. A number of reductions as per company memo. Steven goes on to say, first line of email to team highlights evolving commerce business, launching blockchain group. Uh, company contextualizes cut, says it made 600 corp hires since last year, says it will invest in store leaders, field employees. Now there's also a, like a mad scramble over on the GameStop subreddit. And one person was saying that no one on like the NFT team, which is something that GameStop is making a serious push for is to have their own NFT marketplace, which they may somehow try to get into their physical stores even. And I mean, well, if you see what's going on with the crypto market now and the NFT market, Probably wasn't the best bet to make uh, months ago for them, but hey, that's where they are now. This looks to me like GameStop cutting down expenses, uh, just trying to keep things afloat right now. I mean, we see companies all the time do layoffs and try to lean out their, their balance sheet for expenses, but not great for GameStop in general right now because their stock has been up and down, but they just announced a four to one stock split. And it seems like currently, they at least have some money laying around to kind of get them through what's been a tough time for them with the pandemic and stores being closed, reopen, closed, reopen, kind of been all over the place there. So no cuts for the NFT team, but they cut a bunch of people from the corporate side of things. And we hear about Game Informer having a bunch of layoffs, which I am wondering how, like, how long Game Informer is really going to be around because we saw many layoffs happen uh, last year and now we have more this year and it kind of seems like they're trending in a certain direction there. So I guess we'll find out on that one. And then the CFO is out. So yeah, not a great look for GameStop all the way around in a market that's just not kind to them in general currently, this landscape. So I guess we'll see what happens with them after their stock split completes and, and everything there. And Apparently them taking a shot at an NFT marketplace. We'll see how well that adapts to uh, physical stores. And before we go to the comment of the day, we're gonna take a look at the poll that I posted up yesterday, where I asked, did you miss E3 this year? 59% said yes, 41% said no. I think I'm gonna lean towards yes for this poll, only because it's nice to know when everything's gonna happen. In E3, you can just mark on your calendar, okay, Nintendo's gonna do stuff, Microsoft will do some stuff, Sony probably won't, Capcom will be there, Square. basically all these companies come together, and you know there's this massive information blitz. So you can kinda be prepared for it, whereas we didn't know when anything was gonna happen, right, throughout the, this last month or so. We were, we were hopeful for things, but sometimes they worked out, other times they didn't. So I prefer to at least have that organization and that schedule that we can essentially set our clocks to. And we'll finish up with the comment of the day as you're seeing here. This is from Matt saying, the collector's edition should have a physical copy of the game in it full stop. If you've gone digital, then you've made a decision to bypass physical. The point of a collector's edition is just that, collectability. But if you don't get a physical copy of the game, it defeats the object in my opinion. And you know, I kind of agree with that because if you're buying this big boxed collector's edition that has like the 16-inch the replica Mjolnir and everything, it's like you've already committed to just getting a bunch of cool junk, essentially, which if you buy a digital PlayStation 5, you're essentially saying, I don't really want to have a bunch of stuff on my shelf, so I, I would just prefer to get it digitally. It, it's so strange to me for that. I know they're trying to appease the person who has a digital PlayStation 5 and, and the disc-based PS5 because a digital code work on both of them, but they have a steelbook case in this collector's edition. What? Like, if you're buying the thing, you get a steelbook case, just put a disc in there. I mean, you're already spending hundreds of dollars anyway. And ladies and gentlemen, that's gonna do it here for Newswave. If you enjoyed this video, guys, hit that like button. If not, hit the dislike. Leave comments down below about everything we talked about here today or some of those game announcements yesterday, whether it's a new Terminator survival open world game or a new RoboCop game. And what about E3? Can it make its big return next year in June 2023? And what do you think they should do differently to make it successful? Thanks guys for watching. Have a great weekend. I'll see you back here Monday morning, 8 a.m. Eastern time for Newswave.